If you're thinking about buying a Scrambler 1200 or you've already bought one and want to know more about the bike, you're in the right place because this is possibly the most in-depth review you'll see across the entire interwebs. Today, I'm sharing the good, bad and ugly on the Scrambler 1200. I've now had my Scrambler almost three years and 20,000 Ks. And in that time, I've learned a lot of things about this bike. I've accidentally set it on fire. I've jumped it, dropped it, broken it, fixed it, taken it on so many adventures, on road and off road, in extreme heat and through the pouring rain. I've commuted through the city, I've gone moto camping, I've pushed it to the limits, on motocross tracks, through rivers, along beaches and soft sand, dropped it a few more times, jumped it some more, maintained and serviced and modified it myself. So sit back, relax, and I'll share everything I've learned over the past three years. Okay, so if you've been following the last 20 odd videos I've made, you know I like to be specific and detailed. So I've included a lot of information from my own and others' experiences, as well as tried to answer questions that people often ask me. I also like to back things up with specifications and data, not just the standard catchphrases like confidence inspiring. So here's where things get tricky. If I make a 45 minute video, no one's gonna watch that from end to end in one go. So my plan is to be a bit different. I'm going to break this one down into bite-sized chunks to make it easier for you to navigate and digest the mountain of information that I need to get across. Because I also know from my own experience that I go back to videos like this to get information when I need it or if I've forgotten something. So with that in mind, I've broken it all down into three basic videos. Things I like, which I'll cover in this video, things to fix, which is in the next video and includes tips on how to fix them, and then things to consider and a summary of my thoughts in the final video. This is definitely subjective, but I think a lot of people would agree that one of the biggest draw cards for the Scrambler 1200 over something like a BMW GS or a Tenere is the look and sound straight out of the factory. Not to mention the coolest people ride Triumph Scramblers. Some popular movies like the latest James Bond and even the original King of Cool, Steve McQueen, rode the original Triumph TR6 in his Great Escape Jump. Also, if you don't cringe when 007 just dumps that Scrambler in the last part, it is possible you're a moto sociopath. Okay, seriously though. The way that Triumph have balanced the modern tech with a retro look is really well done, and it doesn't take away from the functionality of the bike. They've really thought about the styling down to the details like the stylish scuff plates down by your feet, the OEM crash bars, and even the TFT screen is pretty slim, and I think it fits the overall styling of the bike. There are a few parts like the stock rear tail setup as well as the mirrors that I think don't look that great from stock, but they're easily fixed with some cheap and easy mods. For details on how I did that, check out my mods videos. As for the sound, the parallel twin can't be matched and at 1200ccs it is an absolute beast. I'll admit the stock mufflers are pretty quiet but they do still sound pretty good with some revs. If you decide you want a bit more noise, there's also a wide range of easy bolt-on mods that you can use to fix that. For now, I'll let the audio do the talking, but if you want more detail on the exhaust and some mods, I've got an entire video dedicated to that linked in the description below. Okay, I'm sure you could see this coming. It's the one thing that you'll never be short on. The torque curve for the Scrambler is so flat, it feels wrong to use the word curve to describe it. It comes on strong from 2500 revs, hits peak torque at 4000 and then holds most of it through to redline. It's also got plenty of horsepower, it comes on progressively and peaks towards the top of the rev range at around 90 horsepower. Compare that with let's say a Ducati 1100 Scrambler, 88 newton meters and 86 horsepower and you'd think that they're not too far apart but then you take a harder look at how the torque comes on for the Triumph and you can see why it's built to tackle serious off-road. 
With so much torque consistently across the rev range, it's really handy to have on tap for things like scrambling hill climbs through to even slow technical stuff. One possible drawback though, is that if you do love a good rip on the throttle like myself, you'll find your rear rubber disappearing very fast. I put a set of Metzler Carew 3s on about 18 months ago and the rear only lasted about 6,000 kilometers and I attribute that to my own inner hoon as well as that tread being quite a soft compound so just be aware of that. Okay, if you've seen any of my scrambler maintenance videos, you'll know how easy it is to service and maintain this bike. Or maybe it's just me, because my first bike was a 1969 Triumph Daytona, and no joke, that thing needed the engine bolts tightened every time you ride it. So maybe I've just got low standards. But comparatively, Triumph have come a long way in a short 50 years since then, and the scrambler maintenance intervals are now 10,000 miles. Or for those that use measurements that make sense, 16,000 kilometers. Also, if you look at the surfacing table in the manual, you can see that the bigger maintenance jobs like valve clearances only need to be done every second service. So that's around 32,000 kilometers, which for me, I probably won't get to for another two or three years at this rate. So basically for the first five years, you're just swapping oil, checking your chain, fluids, brakes, filters, and those regular maintenance items. And these are all jobs that you can just do in a couple of hours. One thing I've never heard anyone dispute is how good the suspension is. Triumph definitely didn't skimp on budget here. With big old dual spring Olins on the back and shower shocks on the front, giving you 250 millimeters of travel front and back. Just to give you an idea of what that means, it's more than a Tenere 700, a BMW GS 1250, a KTM 1190, and the list goes on. So basically it's one of the best suspension setups from stock on an adventure bike. Other than that, there's not much else to say. Just make sure you set it up right for your weight from the start. It's actually super easy. Just check out my suspension setup tutorial. It takes maybe half an hour to set your preload and then from there you only need to tweak a few things here and there when you add weight like camping bags or passengers or if you go off road. Overall, I think the Scrambler handles really well. Yes, the steel fuel tank and engine orientation do make it a little top heavy. On the road, the Scrambler tips into corners easily and the suspension keeps you on track through bumps and potholes without unsettling you. This is one thing I love because some of the roads I ride around the hinterland of Byron Bay and the Gold Coast have copped brutal flooding in the last few years and they are cratered like you wouldn't believe. On the dirt, the Scrambler soaks up a lot of the bumps without feeling too spongy. It manages to maintain great feedback through the bars so you can feel when you might be losing grip or need to make corrections on the fly. As a comparison, I did ride a friend's Tenere and the one thing that struck me immediately was the jittery feeling I had while riding it. That was mostly, I think, because of the feedback that I got through the handlebars being too much. This could also have been tires or suspension settings, but I really felt every single little bump through the bars and that actually made me less confident whilst riding it. That might be something other people like, but for me, I'd prefer slightly less feedback than what I was getting and the Scrambler balances that really well. Now, if you've seen my latest shorts or videos, you know I've dropped my scrambler a few times. What you might not know is that I've only ever broken a clutch lever and one mirror. That's because the bike is designed to have points that come into contact with the ground to minimize the damage of a drop. But this is not the case from stock. So I recommend at minimum getting the engine dresser bars, also known as crash bars, which have a nice subtle look and even when the bike is tipped over, the only things that touch are the crash bars, swing arm and the handlebars. I love the comfort of the Scrambler and the TFT screen and inbuilt electronics are great. And at the risk of offending all the old mates that say the less complicated a bike is, the less there is that can go wrong, I respectfully disagree. Once you set the bike up, the dash connects, I have my maps, navigation, my music plumbed into my helmet and I don't even need to take my hands off the bars because the buttons on the left side can control it all. But there are a few other dash features that Triumph haven't done well and I'll get into that soon. 
Now, I bought this bike because I love the look and sound, but most people will agree it's not your bike until you make it yours. That to me means modifying the looks and functionality to reflect what you prefer. Now, I've gone into a lot of modding and others have taken it way further than me, but there's such a good base here that it doesn't take long to make the bike into an absolute beast. And that's probably the biggest reason I love this bike. If you want to know more, check out my mods video link in the description below. Okay, that's it for this video, but make sure you subscribe because next week things are going to get real. I'm getting into the details about the bad and ugly things I've experienced with the Scrambler. And then after that, I've got a third and final video weighing up all of the pros and cons, as well as some tips and things to consider to wrap up my long-term review.